one of the things which, you know, it is always in the back of my mind is what's going on with the BRICS, because uh, I think they're they're serious about uh, finding um, some way to get away from the seniorage of the dollar. And um, I don't think that can be reversed. I wish it could, you know, because one of the great things about the United States was its its ability to bring stability not only through its military presence, but through its economic presence. And without the dollar as it was, it, you know, it means you, you, know, you have a lot more instability, which is also, you know, I think one of the things underpinning gold is it's going to continue to keep gold bid. JJ, there's a chart that's recently gone around showing U.S. tech stocks have raced past their earnings similar to the late 1990s. I don't know if you've seen it, but with that in mind, do you see a similar outcome potentially as the dot-com crash to hit the tech companies this time around? Well, these are risky prices, you know. There's, there's no such thing as like a, a risky asset. It's just a risky risky price, you know, and uh, – these are really risky prices. Um, it's just a lot of length in the market right now, you know. And, and the thing about markets, you know, when they get, it's really hard to make money on the highs because the higher the prices go, the more money it takes to get them to go up, you know. And it has to come from somewhere. So if you have 10 stocks sucking all the oxygen out of the ring, yeah, they're, they're, they're risky. Um, that means they have to. They have to earn enough money to justify their their uh, valuations, and I think the expectations are very very high right now. So, I've seen you know good news bad action type market uh, where we might come in with earnings that don't beat or little beats, and uh, the market will punish them for that. So, so, I think that yeah. So the risk is to the downside for them, not to the upside. Risk is always to the downside now for the stock market, you know, different than, than like, you know, COVID or even in 2021 where there was no risk. All you had to do was buy anything, you know. You could buy Exxon in 30, 35, right. you know. It's a, <laughs> a company with a rating that was higher than the U.S. Treasury, never skipped a dividend for, for 80 years, and it was yielding 11% in a 0% company. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, that's not like where we are now. This is that is this is that is not today. You know, yeah. So they always the risk is the downside. Something, anything, you don't know when it's going to come. Uh, although we have not had an event, I was surprised when they when uh, <laughs> there was an assassination of Trump uh, attempt on Trump. The market went up. So, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from from these questions, your answers, our dialogue, it does feel like you you sense that at some point you don't you don't have a timing uh, idea. But at some point and likely in the near future, that there is going to be something to drag this thing down. Uh, I don't know. Drag. I wouldn't say drag. Let's just say this. I am keenly aware of the age of of stocks in general, uh, and I don't I don't sense any any end imminent end. But I'm not afraid of it. I I you know I've been through a bunch of these things. I've ridden out a lot of bad bears. Um, it you know <laughs> it can only sustain this much tension for for um, a period of time. I mean, you can't have a new high every four days on infinitum. Oh, and right. certainly, later, you know, no one knows what it's going to be because I don't see it now. I, I really don't. The only thing I see is like seasonal weakness in August. Market is heavily long right now. Uncertainty with the election. We have Kamala Harris. I don't know whether that's that's an investable thing where you can say, oh, oh boy, we're going to have Kamala for president. I'm going to go out and buy more stocks. But on the other hand, you know, Trump would be uh, so, um, well, he was 
incredibly different tax cuts, you know, and bring it all home, you know, American manufacturing, that would be so different. That might might have an effect on stocks because we're heavily weighted towards other things. I don't know. We'll have to see. I don't think uh, I don't think it'll be as bad as people think it is, though. So, JJ, you've been in and around commodities and commodity cycles for more than four decades. Many believe that we're entering or have already entered a period for commodity super cycle. We're definitely in a very volatile period of time. What is your outlook on the commodity super cycle um, and why? Well, a super cycle would imply uh, real inflation, you know, gasoline at 10 bucks, not two. And it would probably start with energy because it's one of the most important things. It would also imply severe shortages of food, uh, like we had in the 70s, you know, where the Russians came in and they bought the entire wheat crop and we went from like about 50 to six bucks. And that was 1970. So we were to do something right now. We'd have grain prices in the 30 to $50 a bushel range. That would be super cycle type stuff. If just if we were to go back and re redo, get a redo of what we once had, you'd also <clears throat> have an awful lot of bad luck in super cycles that uh, you can't control. They'd be weather related, things like that. Um, you also have trade wars, uh, a lot of currency dislocation. Uh, one of the things which you know it is always in the back of my mind is what's going on with the BRICS. Because uh, I think they're they're serious about uh, finding um, some way to get away from the seniorage of the dollar, and um, I don't think that can be reversed. I wish it could, you know, because one of the great things about the United States was its its ability to bring stability not only through its military presence but through its economic presence, and without the dollar as it was, it you know, it means you 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 have a lot more instability, which is also you know. I think one of the things underpinning gold and it's going to continue to keep gold bid, despite you know other things maybe not not doing so well. In in commodities. So yeah, so talk you know just thinking through that commodity super cycle. Um, while we don't see evidence of some of those things that you just outlined um, based on, you know, the bricks, based on some of the bifurcations taking place geopolitically um, and the access to some of these commodities based on the CapEx uh, investment shortfalls that have taken place. I mean, what's the, what's the probability that as the, months and years go on that something like that could begin to unfold? Maybe not go to those extremes, but could begin to unfold. Very hard. You know, we've got, we've got just in the United States, we've got 200 years of natural gas reserves. We're, natural gas today is trading like two bucks on the Merck. I was a local in natural gas in 1990 when they, when they actually uh, launched that contract and natural gas was trading two bucks. So, you know, it went up to 15 and in the Y2K years and it came down and blah, blah, blah. But since, since the, uh, you know, the development of fracking, what we have here, um, the United States is the largest producer of oil in the world, uh, the third largest exporter of oil in the world. Like I said, we have masses of natural gas. Um, it's gonna be really hard to have a super cycle in commodities when you have that much stability in energy. You know, it, yeah, oil can go up, you know, if somebody gets crazy and, and like the Houthis are, you know, chasing ships around. We have a little heat in Gaza and Israel, but I, I think those guys, you know, if, You've got a lot of steady hands in oil right now, where we had a lot of crazy people in oil. Oil is is uh, a negotiable commodity. <clears throat> I think it's going to stay right here, seventy five eighty. If it goes up, 
you know, it'll go up gradually. I, I don't think there's going to be any radical. The, the risk in oil is that it goes down. Then it can go down. Okay. So, uh, you know, you mentioned copper earlier. Copper's experienced <laughs> nine consecutive down days, its longest losing streak since January 2020. Today it's down to flat the last time I looked. Right. What's copper telling you right now based on this action? Well, first of all, you know, if you if if you look at the forecast for what we're going to consume, notwithstanding like uh, you know a stock bust and slow economy to recover, but you know, I see that as like shallow dips. Um, we don't have enough copper, and one of the most interesting stories this year was the uh, BHP move for Anglo, which the market loved that. You know, like. Copper is, is dominated by China. They're the largest consumer of copper. They produce a lot of copper. Uh, they have all of the marginal stocks of copper now in Taiwan and Korea and Asia. Uh, there's very little in Europe. We have zero here in the United States. So having BHP buy Anglo and be that kind of a, of a, it, 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 it would have been like, it would have been like, uh, Exxon buying uh, Chevron, you know, to the market. It would have been that that big a deal. And I don't think China really liked that, you know. I don't I, – I'm not sure they didn't get involved and say, hey, you know, we don't, we don't want you guys doing this. Uh, you know, they have uh, – they bought the LME, so they are in total control of trading and price discovery of all the base metals. The one thing that they didn't have is they didn't have COMEX. And right now on COMEX, there is no copper. I don't know if you've looked at what's going on in, in, in terms of LME warehouses in the Americas. Well, okay, I'll, I'll run it down for you. There is zero, zero. Let me just put that another way. No, none, zero copper in LME warehouses in America. And we had a squeeze in May where the front spread for uh, May, July, it's trading along about negative four, seventy, negative three, which is normal contango. And it went to like 11 cents back because no one had copper to deliver into the, uh, the May contract. So they rolled out to July. And then when July came, they rolled it all to step. And uh, right now, Well, there's a regular open interest and the front spreads in Contango. So that implies to me that somewhere out there on the ocean, it takes about 65 days to get it over here. There has to be at least 100,000 tons of copper somewhere in ships heading our way. But, you know, logistically, if it's coming from China, it's got to get to San Francisco. Well, how are they going to get it over the Rockies? You know, I don't know. I... <laughs> It's very difficult. You can't get through the Panama Canal because there's a drought. The water's too shallow. They'd have to unload it, put it on little ships, to get it up to Louisiana. So the other way they get is to go around the Horn, come all the way around up to New York. And I'm sure that's possible. Maybe Trophy and Glencore and guys like that, you know, they know how to do it. But right now it is, we're a few days from the 1st of August. We're four weeks from first notice day in September. We've got a really good size open interest on the COMEX. And anyone... I invite you to, you know, enlighten me. Where where's the metal going to come from uh, when we get to, um, you know, Labor Day? Because and so uh, I thought of this: if I were in a chess game and I were China and I wanted to just get rid of the COMEX so that I could have total control of copper and all the base metals, it's sort of like a monopoly game. Um, I would. I would bleed out all of their warehouses and I wouldn't put it back in and I would keep all of my copper in Taiwan, Shanghai and uh and Korea. But that's very conspiratorial and I'm not a copper expert. But so why why do you suppose the price has gone down nine straight days then? I don't know. This you know, this like I said, it's it's very hard to interfere in in markets these days, you know, like if I, I'm, it implies that there's a surplus of copper, right? Okay. It's gone down. If you look at open interest on the COMEX, though, price has gone down like this, right? So open interest on the COMEX has gone like this. 
doesn't go down at all. And whenever you have open interest that does not move, that means one side of that open interest is not moving. So you have, if all the longs are not selling and you have movement, right? That means it's just shorts trading with shorts every day like this. Right? But the longs, they're sitting there and saying, well, we're just not moving. So if I'm long 60,000 lots of copper and I don't sell it, open interest is, it's not going to go down. And so that's another enigmatic curiosity in the copper market right now. But we'll, sooner or later, we'll find that. It's likely to change too, right? All right. So, JJ, gold reduces drawdowns in times of market stress in a more volatile macro environment. A different mix of investments are usually needed, including more real assets in a diversified investment portfolio. In your analysis, do you expect to see gold entering portfolio mixes more and more as market volatility increases? You had mentioned earlier that it's basically non-existent in, in the Western investment world. What do you see for gold over the next 12 months? Uh, I, I think we're going to pretty much the same game. Um, <clears throat> foreign central banks are the primary buyers. They have a reason for it, and they're going to continue to do it. Um, in the West, Europe, London, United States, you know, I own gold, but I actually I own mining stocks. Um, gold is it's a very hard market to trade. Let me just say that. It, it, this year, gold's gone up a lot. Um, like in October, it went up for a few weeks, maybe $150. From the low 19s, it went up to like uh, 2050. And then it sat there from... November to March, it did absolutely nothing flat. And then in March, it went up for about five weeks, $500 vertically, and then it stopped. So if you don't catch it just right, you wind up holding gold in a fairly severe contangle market, which uh, is about $100 an ounce uh, per year. So you know, of the $500 that went up, if, if you bought it, um, let's just say from 1900 to 2400 um, pretty soon in a couple of months, you will have only made 400 And if it goes flat for a longer time, it just keeps going down, keeps going down. Yeah. So you have to have good timing. Do you uh, see? Do you see gold being critically important um, or growing the way it did in the 70s and early 2000s, or do you see it more like, you know, 2016? Or how, how do you see gold, gold's growth in price moving forward over the, you know, the coming years? Well, like I said, with oil, you know, gasoline, it's hedonically cheap. And gold is hedonically re relatively cheap. So, Although it goes up, it's really, it's just unevenly adjusting. Um, it's going to happen. It's going to go up. It always does. Gold goes up. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to ever regain, you know, like the focus that it had in the 70s, because in the 70s, we didn't have S&Ps. You know, we had no stock indexes. We didn't have a lot of sophisticated products that we have right now. We didn't have bond futures. Um, we had gold grains. We had a cash stock market. We had a coal market for for leverage that was at about fifty percent, I think. You know, none of that. You know, now it's it's gold is gold is um, it's out there, but it's it's only going to become relative in the West if if something changes dramatically. And I I don't know whether that'll happen. So you brought up. Uh, mining equities. JJ, there was an unexpected and punishing drop in the gold mining equities recently. Can you give your best analysis on what's happening with the miners and based on improving margins, what is your 12-month outlook for the miners? I think they're going up. I think that they're they're, they're the Exxon Mobil of, of the COVID. Uh, they're remarkably cheap. They've paid down tremendous amount of debt. Shareholders' equity is going up like crazy. The, uh, I saw Newmont's uh, earnings, uh, was it Wednesday? They were 
they were excellent. Uh, AISC was a little high, uh, like uh, 1500 ish or something like that. But, you know, they're, they're just printing cash, you know, and <laughs> it's, and, you know, I'm not sure whether it's a hedge fund model or something like that, where they acquire a lot of shares in front of Irvings because, you know, um, the community of people that buy mining shares, were, I guess we're kind of like innocent kids, you know, like we see the truth and we get all excited about it and we're thinking, oh, Newmont's just going to kill it and they do kill it and then <laughs> just bury it, <laughs> you know, but that's that's just trading. You know, this has nothing to do with the underlying grinding truth of of what Newmont and Agnico and all these really great companies. You know, Agnico has no debt. I think they have, might have a billion. I think, I think Barrick is down to a billion. And their their ASCs are between twelve and fifteen hundred, which means they're going to make a thousand dollars on every ounce they pull out of the. Ground. Amazing. It's just you know. So okay, go ahead. Sell it short. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. So silver has been taking a beating recently. On silver, you wrote that technical developments indicate Comex Silver is a passenger, not a player in this story. However, U.S. dollar weakness usually means higher prices. And U.S. dollars either weak or steady against everything. U.S. fixed income rallied in the Asian session, indicating appetite for treasuries as a safe haven. So, JJ, what do you see happening with silver currently and over the next 12 months? Okay, so uh, first of all, perspective on silver. If silver's like a little BB to gold being a basketball, you know. Or, or a bowling ball because it has that kind of mass. Silver is, I think silver's going up. I think it's going to go up a lot more than gold. But right now, whatever's going on internally, has something to do with Asia. Uh, the big move from 22 in March up to uh, 32, which is a 50% move this year, came from Asia. Um, CNH, you know, got hit very hard. Uh, the end is rallying. So I think locally over there, I I, uh, I covered ICBC uh, for about six years working for a bank in New York. Those guys love to gamble. Uh, Asians just love to gamble, you know. So they probably got over their skis uh, with a lot of silver. And metals are, you know, there's no BLS of the metals, you know. <laughs> You have to accept what they tell you, and uh, everybody lies. You know, there's, there's, you just gotta have to figure it out. You know, so right now, silver's, silver's being sold, but I don't think it's gonna last. I think, you know, it's cheap. So you wrote this morning on your Substack about commodities that many of them are on their lows. Some are not big moves, but still tracking the bottom of their ranges. Everywhere you look, prices are falling. It's not uniform. It is title. Will you speak into what you were seeing when you were writing that? Sure. Um, commodities are kind of like a family of, of like what, I remember the phrase in Moneyball, an island of misfit, misfit toys, right? So when, when money is going into commodities, it tends to go broadly and and for long periods of time. And right now, after several years of, of uh, very restricted policy, this is all, you know, hitting because commodities operate with contango. And it's very expensive to hold commodities in contango. So people just, you know, they, they, they get rid of them. And uh, this happens to be something that's happening, particularly in metals right now. After a run-up in March, everybody got too long, and so they're all coming down. Grains are as low as I've seen them in a long time. Uh, we already talked about base metals. What else is going on in commodities? Gasoline is cheap, and this is the middle of the driving season. There's... Uh, Lots of oil in America in terms of storage. 
lots of products, massive amounts of, of uh, natural gas. So, uh, yeah, everything's on the lows. So this has been a fantastic conversation. Before we wrap up here, and I asked JJ our final question, I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer economy markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and every single expert interview that we conduct, just like this one, they're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, if you don't own gold, you know neither history nor economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed this conversation with JJ as much as I have. Please let him know. Hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video. It's now time for our golden nugget segment. JJ, let's discuss portfolio positioning. Knowing that you're not a financial advisor, and based on all that we've discussed today and with your experience and worldview as the backdrop, how are you positioning for the next 12 months? What assets do you like and what assets do you absolutely want to stay away from? Well, I like the miners. You know, I, I like I like companies that earn money. So I'm always looking for that kind of thing. I'm not going to mention any specific stocks, but I own a few of them. And in various sectors. I I never really got into Bitcoin. Uh so I don't own anything anything in the crypto world at all. I uh I tend to always keep biz below the market. I don't chase I never run after the last guy who speaks. I you know I never see something, oh Nvidia's going up, I have to buy it. Maybe that's a good idea. But I don't do it that way. So if I want something, you know I just think about, you know, what's going on with the market and I leave, I leave bits. And if I get filled, well, that's, that's, that's good. So, you know, a mix of stocks, mostly, you know, balanced portfolio. We have a 60, 40 family portfolio, which is, I think everybody should have, you know, if in good times, you know, you're always going to be okay. And at bad times, you're going to be okay. So, that's a stability, and um, I I would recommend if you're not a, a very sophisticated player, to be very careful with commodities. It's a hit and run game. Uh, there's no such thing as investing in commodities. You know, holding them over time is always going to be bad. I mean, even though you may get it right for a little while, you have to be willing to just take your money and and harvest. You know, just like you know a farm produces crops, you harvest the crops, you sell them. That's the same thing about commodities and gold, you know, take the money. Don't don't be a guy who's going to be going to his drawer, taking out those Kruger rents that he bought in like, you know, I don't know, 1995, because uh, that's dead money. You don't, you don't want to have that. So, JJ, thank you so much for coming on to the Metals and Miners podcast, for being so generous with your time, your analysis and ideas. It's really been a fantastic time to spend with you. Would you please share with the viewers, what is the overall theme that you want to leave with those tuning in? Where can they learn more about your current work and how can they connect with you? Okay. So I write on Substack at uh, JJ745 at Substack.com. And I have a, uh, I have a presence on X, uh, which is Alyosha. 745 at x.com and i i post uh some of my sub stacks on on um on x and every now and then i post charts if i if i think about it you know i think well okay this is a good idea i'll, I'll share it with the world and um i write uh a morning piece of about 700 words every morning on Substack, and i write an evening wrap to cover the markets for Asia. Well, fantastic. Everybody, if you're not following JJ, you really need to. I will be putting up 
uh, the Substack and the Twitter X handle for everybody to, to see, to click through. It'll be in the description, and I'll have it big and bold right where you shared it. Um, please follow him. He's a wealth of knowledge, especially for the industries that we're paying attention to. So I look forward to having you back on, JJ. Thank you for being here with us. And everybody else, thank you for watching. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. Thank you. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must-read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us.